There's a sutta where the Buddha lists things that are desirable but hard to obtain. And it's an interesting list. Some of the things are worldly, like wealth, friendship. And others have to do with the Dharma. Things like virtue, celibacy, discernment, and the Dharma itself. Two of the most interesting explanations he has as to the obstacles to these things are the ones for discernment and for Dharma. For discernment, he says, the obstacles are an unwillingness to listen and lack of questioning. Now this can apply to discernment in its sense of the discernment that comes from listening and the discernment that comes from thinking. If you don't listen, you're not going to learn. Or you can hear things, but if you have no questions, you don't really engage with how that lesson relates to your mind. And that's for the Dharma. Here it's a Dharma in the sense that the Thai John's talking about finding the Dharma or reaching the Dharma. It's not so much the teachings. It's more the quality of Dharma within your own heart. And the two obstacles there, the Buddha said, are lack of commitment and no reflection. In other words, if you don't do the dharmas, that's one of the meaning of dharma, by the way, it was an action. If you don't do the actions the Buddha recommended, you're not going to know it. You'll just know the names of the dharmas. But the dharma itself, the quality of the heart that comes from the practice, that's going to be beyond you. But simply doing it, committing yourself to the practice is not enough. You have to reflect on it. Remember the Buddha's image to Rahula when he first taught him about the practice. Look at your actions as you'd look into a mirror, because your actions reflect your mind. Of course, the mind is where we want to look anyhow. So you have to have this quality of reflecting back. When you do something, what's the intention? When you finish something, what were the results? Were they in line with your intention? What could be improved? It's this ability to reflect on your actions. That's where you're going to learn, especially the Dharma that's really going to be useful. After all, as the Four Noble Truths point out, the cause of suffering is not outside. It's not in sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. It's not in what other people do or don't do. It's in what your own mind does or doesn't do. Yet the minds are constantly flowing out paying attention to things outside, and paying very little attention to themselves. So we've got to turn that around. Of course, simply looking at the mind can get pretty depressing. This is why you also commit yourself to the practice. This is a quality of truthfulness. If you're going to know the truth, as John Lee used to say, if you're going to know the truth, you have to be true. If you're unwilling to commit, it's like someone standing on the edge of a swimming pool and the water looks cold and, gee, that water looks awfully cold, I don't know if I can take it. And you wonder about it, but you don't jump in. As long as you don't jump in, you're not going to know anything about it. You have to give yourself to the practice if you're really going to know it. That attitude that a lot of people have this is, well, prove it to me first and then I'll practice. That gets you nowhere. There's so many things in the practice that you have to take as working hypotheses that can't be proven, beginning with the fact that you actually can do an action. It's not some outside force acting through you. You don't really know that. There are so many things we think we know, but we don't. But the Buddha says, take it as a hypothesis. The quality of your intentions will determine the results of the actions, and these results will come back to you. Take that as a working hypothesis. Commit yourself. Try these things out. The Buddha's argument 
before you try things out, is that, well, think about if you didn't believe in the power of your actions, would you be careful in what you did? No. And if you do, yes. Okay, that's a pragmatic test. But then again, the real proof comes when you actually do it. And John Fung made this point in one of his Dharma talks, one of the few that were actually transcribed, recorded. He says, if you suffer from uncertainty, it's because of a lack of truth in yourself. Because the things that the Buddha says you should be certain about are not far off. They deal with what's skillful in the mind, what's unskillful in the mind. And if you don't actually try to develop some skill, you're not going to know. You wouldn't have a basis for comparison. So you've got to do these things if you're going to understand them, if you're going to gain some discernment. You have to do the path in order to understand the path and reflect on what you're doing as you do it. We see this with the precepts. We see this with the practice of generosity, really basic stuff. Consciously be more generous. Consciously be stricter with yourself about the precepts. And notice what happens. If you're going to be stricter about the precepts, you find you're more careful. If you're more generous, you find there's a good quality develops in the mind. And the lessons you've learned there then give you a little bit more confidence as you meditate. That you know how to observe your mind. I don't know how many people come and say, well, I can't tell what's a comfortable breath from an uncomfortable breath. Well, who's going to tell it for you? You've got to try a certain rhythm of breathing for a while, and then you try another rhythm of breathing, and then you compare the, the results. You're not going to know until you do. The right view gives you some pointers as to what to do and things to look for. But the actual knowledge is something else. It comes from doing things and then reflecting on the actions and then changing them and reflecting on, on your actions and the results. And you begin to gain a sense of the difference, which is more skillful, which is more useful which has a better impact on the mind. And that's the kind of discernment that allows you to see the Dharma as a quality in the heart. And that's the kind of discernment that's really worthwhile. That's what we're aiming at. It is possible to understand the books, what's in the books, what's in the suttas, what's in the teachings of the Ajans, on one level. If you're going to make a value judgment as to the worth of those teachings, you have to put them into practice. And remember that discernment is a value judgment as to what is worth doing, what's not worth doing. Because everything the Buddha teaches is focused on action. Because as you see your actions, you begin to see the mind in action. And you catch yourself, oh, I'm doing this, I'm clinging here, I'm craving there, here in the midst of the things that I want to do, I've, I can find some stress. I can find the causes for stress. Do I still want to do them? If you don't see an alternative, you'll do with it, you stick with it regardless. But when you start seeing that there are all alternatives. then your discernment develops. You see distinctions. This is why trying to see everything as one is not how you develop discernment. As the Buddha said, to gain discernment you have to see things as separate. This is one thing, that's something else. Doing this gives these results, doing that gives those results. Which is better? Which is more worthwhile? 
as Lumpur used to say, you develop your discernment by trying to see things in pairs. Have something to compare. I have a student who teaches software design. He said one of his most effective lessons one time was he, he had a student who wrote what he called ugly code. And he had to give the student a sense of how ugly it was. And so he pulled out a piece of code that was designed to do basically what the student's code was designed to do in a much more elegant way. And it's because the student could see, okay, these two things were aiming at the same purpose, but they went about it in a very different way, and one was obviously superior. The student really began to improve his skills. So to, when you see things in pairs, when you have something to compare in your actions, you commit yourself to doing one thing, you commit to doing something slightly different, and then you reflect. That's how you get the kind of discernment that comes from developing, which is the discernment that's going to make a difference in your mind. This is the strength of discernment that develops on conviction. Without conviction, you're not going to commit. When you have conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, all these things come together to make your discernment strong. And then the discernment turns around and it solidifies those other qualities, because you begin to see things for yourself. You're taking them not just on faith or because you believe in them. It's because you've seen them. You move from right view to right knowledge. And it's the knowledge that makes a difference in the mind. Some people t talk about cutting the fetters, like how they're going to cut the fetters and get to stream entry. But it doesn't work that way. The fetters are not something you can cut through an act of will. Because there'll be something hiding behind that act of will. When you've had your first glimpse of the deathless, you come back and everything else looks different. It's that glimpse, the seeing, that cuts the fetters. It's the seeing that makes a difference. And where does that ability to see come from? From committing yourself and reflecting. So keep these two principles in mind. They're the nutriment for your discernment that makes it strong.